Uh, right, there we go. There's a marker. <coughs> and we're just coming up for 7 o'clock. We'll begin the lecture in a little moment. Today, we're going to be doing it slightly differently. Previously, up to now, I've been using PowerPoint um, to, well, you know, to do the presentation with a mixture of uh, the slides and being able to see me chat to you. Um, uh, this week, I did. I really didn't feel like doing a PowerPoint. I don't like PowerPoint anyway. Um, I find it kind of constrains what's going on um, a bit too much. Sometimes it's useful. I mean, I suppose if you if you've got some sort of very specific sort of set of information to to present, then it can be really useful. And if you've got something um, visual that is that is able to you know um, articulate what you're doing then again PowerPoint can be particularly useful uh, I'm not always convinced it's particularly brilliant when it comes to doing philosophy um, partly because in the end we kind of often have to focus very closely on the text and so that becomes a little bit strange inside PowerPoint so this week I'm gonna be talking to you as I would in a class actually um, where I very rarely use PowerPoint, perhaps at the start of a course to sort of outline the structure of a course, but I rarely use PowerPoint in a course. <clears throat> but what I would do <coughs> is obviously have my own lecture notes and then we'd have a text. And so today that's kind of what we're going to be doing a little bit. There will be a bit where we kind of look at the text and I'll have it on the screen for you. Um, uh, but apart from that, I'm going to just sort of talk to you through my notes um, and we'll see how that goes. Right, so let's get started, shall we? This is, I believe, the sixth lecture in the course, um, which is called Hell is Other People, Existentialism in a Time of Crisis. Uh, we've looked in the first four weeks at Kierkegaard's Fear and Trembling, and last week we began looking at Jean-Paul Sartre and a book called The Transcendence of the Ego. Um, now, Last week, what we did, let's have a little bit of a recap. So last week, we, we looked at the first half of Transcendence of the Ego last week, and this week we're going to be looking at the second half, really. I mean, that's kind of <coughs> the breakdown, sorry, <coughs> the breakdown of how things are working. Um, so let's just do a little bit of a recap of some of the stuff that we were talking about last week. Uh, okay, so let's begin with the kind of sort of prime argument that, that initiates Sartre, which is in relationship to um, Immanuel Kant's account of subjectivity. So Immanuel Kant he classically is seen to bring together the problems produced by rationalists like Descartes and Leibniz and empiricists like Hume and Locke. Um, who seem who, who are kind of like two streams of early modern philosophy they're the two kind of fundamental streams of early modern philosophy um, and both of them end up in kind of you know quite problematic sort of distance from each other um, unable almost to communicate um, and producing very sort of different problems and on the one hand the rationalist produces a sense of certainty quite often trying to produce a sense of certainty in the existence of God but even even less than that, just producing a sense of certainty in, for example, the existence of the self, famously in Descartes' cogito, the I think, therefore I am. And uh, and empiricism, on the other hand, often produces a kind of a, a lack of certainty. Let's call it that. Uh, it's not really doubt. A lack of certainty or contingency. That's a better word, I think, for what empiricists are, are focused on. Um, and that's most famously probably put forward by Hume in his um, attack on what we think of as causal relations. So when we think there's causes and effects, Hume argues that in fact it, this is kind of a constant conjunction. We, we happen to have these things go together so we kind of get the habit of feeling um, like there's some relationship of necessity or cause uh, between the cause and effect where in fact they're just things that go together. And so rationalism and empiricism had produced a, a, a large split in early modern philosophy and Kant kind of came about as, in some way, a new moment. And he attempts to articulate um, what he calls the conditions of possibility of experience. So what must be the case, the condition of possibility, what must be the case for us to have any experience whatsoever? And one of the things central to that is 
um, a claim that he makes which Sartre accepts um, and the claim is that an I think uh, must be able to accompany all of our representations. Um, so this this kind of notion of a representation, an example is I'm seeing a tree. I look outside, I'm seeing a tree. That's a representation. I'm seeing a tree. Um, and at any point, that seeing of the tree, that kind of relationship to that tree, can, is capable of having this self-awareness, this self-identity um, articulated in the phrase, I think. So instead of just I'm seeing a tree, I think I'm seeing a tree. Um, and in that moment, we have a kind of bringing together of all the different sensations that I might be have a kind of unification. In fact, Kant calls this the transcendental unity of apperception. Um, apperception just means the various kind of things I can perceive, if you like. It's probably the easiest way of thinking about it. So this idea that an I think must be able to accompany all of our representations is kind of key for Kant. There isn't an experience in which I couldn't say, I think I'm having this experience. It's kind of a basic structure. It's one of the conditions of possibility for any experience whatsoever. Um, what Sartre does um, is take this Kantian possibility structure um, and he kind of re responds to it by what we might call an, uh, the Sartrean actual experience argument, um, where he basically says that, that whilst what Kant is saying is valid and it's a valid relationship to possibility, um, so the possibility of any experience, it doesn't, it's not sufficient for determining what an actual experience is. And in, actually, in fact, uh, Sartre says, there are lots of times at which the I think does not accompany the representation, does not accompany it. And the crucial thing that, that, that Sartre is saying is that this, this Kantian moment where we kind of limit and set up the kind of things that are necessary for us to have experience, the kind of things that any experience whatsoever has to kind of have as features of itself. Um, what Sartre is basically arguing is that that doesn't really tell us anything about the, 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 the actual experience itself. Those, those actual experiences still need to be fundamentally focused upon as the most important things. And so we move from the Kantian kind of possibility structure to a Sartrean actual experience, if you like. Um, and then what Sartre does next is, is this crucial move that, that we were talking about last week, uh, both in the lecture and, and in the seminar afterwards. Our seminars begin at 8 p.m. on Zoom, by the way, um, for free university people. We were talking about this a little bit afterwards in the seminar as well, which is the, what we can, this is the, the third kind of moment, if you like, the, the reflective realisation. Um, so Kant puts forward this idea about possible structures of experience, any possible experience, and says the I think must be able to accompany them. Sartre says, yeah, the I think must be able to accompany them, but doesn't in fact accompany them all the time. And so he asks the question, well, when does the I accompany them then? What is, what, at what point does this sort of kind of Kantian moment actually show itself? And this is what we would call the reflective realisation. And realisation here, I'm trying to play on this word of realisation. The reflective moment makes real the I, but in that reflective moment there's a kind of realisation of the I in the sense of like I realise something has happened, or I realise something is happening. Um, and there are two elements to this that Sartre sort of points to. He says, um, on the one hand, the I appears at once, as soon as we begin to reflect. Um, and he also says that the I never appears uh, except when I begin to reflect. So only when I'm doing some reflection on myself, on my awareness, on my consciousness, only then does the I actually appear. Um, and what he establishes is a, is, a, is a strong distinction between two different elements, two different um, modes, if you like, of consciousness. And this is the crucial point to try and remember. There are two different modes of consciousness, therefore. For Sartre, there is the pre reflective mode of consciousness and the reflective mode. And in the reflective mode, we have a, a kind of consciousness that's being reflected upon. Um, and these aren't split. These are, these are, sometimes, this, this, sometimes this does appear or is referred to as a split. Um, and it's not unreasonable to think of it perhaps as a split, but the problem with that is that, um, that they aren't separate. Uh, they aren't capable of being completely separated out. In principle, the pre-reflective mode is autonomous. Sorry, let me just turn that notification thing off. I don't want it beeping and you probably can't hear it, but if you can, I'll turn it off. The pre-reflective moment is, Sartre thinks, 
autonomous so it, you don't have to be able to reflect on it you don't have to reflect on it rather you can have a pre-reflective mode of consciousness and never get to this moment of reflection in other words you know um, it's not that one produces the other I'm not sure why that just did oh so, hello <laughs> right uh, hello i three two no 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 sorry sorry i can't quite read that thank you for the follow um so the pre-reflective moment can exist autonomously and the reflective moment uh you know only appears uh, well rather the reflective moment produces the eye when it appears but the two things aren't necessarily split they're much more like um the relationship we have with a mirror perhaps and i'm going to use that quite sort of deliberately so obviously in a relationship to a mirror um the me and my reflection are kind of they're kind of one thing with two different elements to it but they're kind of unified um and any kind of sense in which the thing in the mirror had an all time <laughs> it's a reference to a tie oh cool yes story of the eye sorry off, off track there um so yeah, the, the 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 moment of the mirror reflection. Obviously, it's not like somehow the thing in the mirror wanders off and you know says hi to friends while we're not there or we're not looking. It only exists in the sense um, in this particular relationship. But this this and the reason I'm I'm saying mirror is because there's a kind of very interesting connection or a very interesting uh, resonance between Sartre's work at this particular point in time in his life and uh, the work of someone called Jean Le or Jacques Lacan. Um, it's around this time that Sartre is writing Transcendence of the Ego in 1937. A year before that, Lacan had um, introduced a paper on the, that brought about what he called the mirror stage. It's the first mention that he really has of this in public. Um, and there's some very interesting dynamics going on in this particular moment, which I'll come back to later. For now, it's just worth sort of saying that that, that idea of that the example of the mirror isn't completely random. But again, the important point here is this pre-reflective, reflective element of consciousness. And consciousness has both of these modes. So let's look at this pre-reflective consciousness. The thesis of transcendental, the transcendence of the ego uh, that Sartre puts forward, the thesis that he self describes as the thesis of the book, is the following. Um, transcendental consciousness, he says, is an impersonal spontaneity. Uh, and this is kind of the absolute crux of transcendence of the ego. Um, it's this idea of, of an impersonal spontaneity. He also describes it in the transcendence of the ego, he describes it in curious ways, this particular spontaneity, and it's this spontaneity that I want to kind of focus on tonight. So he describes this spontaneity as, for example, this monstrous spontaneity. This is page 99. He describes us as, in one point, as being monstrously free. And what he's pushing at is that spontaneity produces a problem Sartre articulates this in terms of the, the idea of voluntary and involuntary. Um, and we can begin to see the problem here that Sartre is like really, really trying to articulate. So if we take the distinction between the voluntary and the, and the involuntary, one of the things that Sartre argues is that it doesn't fit onto spontaneity. You can't have, as it were, um, an involuntary spontaneity or a voluntary spontaneity. Um, and consciousness is he thinks fundamentally a spontaneity and so we have a kind of real issue here as to whether spontaneity can kind of um, be articulated into any sense of agency any sense of action any sense of me doing um, this kind of sense that we might have behind behind what we say when we say that action was voluntary or i am taking a voluntary action or i didn't couldn't help myself it was an involuntary response those kind of distinctions between voluntary and involuntary um, have a real problem in meshing up with this sartrean notion of spontaneity um, and more importantly this spontaneity <laughs> this spontaneity which is going to be kind of the core driving force of what sartre is artic articulating this spontaneity is fundamentally impersonal. Um, so if, if the distinction between voluntary and involuntary doesn't really fit onto spontaneity, and if consciousness is fundamentally a spontaneity and an impersonal one at that and comes before any sense of personhood, um, then this spontaneity, Sartre argues, 
both a liberation and a capture. Um, and this is, is kind of articulated in, in this, well, I suppose, famous phrase. It's a troublesome phrase, but it's a famous phrase from Sartre where he says, one is condemned to be free. Um, and it's, uh, I think, famous perhaps because it's so clearly kind of paradoxical. It's this, this con being condemned to be free produces this kind of slight fuzz in the head. And you think, well, what on earth are you talking about? How can, how can the two things kind of go together? How can you articulate them in that particular way? But it's this relationship between liberation and capture that he thinks is kind of core to the dynamics of consciousness um, and is produced by the very nature of consciousness itself as spontaneity. So I will take a break in about maybe 10, 15 minutes and we'll have a little five minute break before we continue. But for now, I just want to continue with this thought around liberation and capture. So consciousness, we might say, is, um, is an experience of both liberation and capture. Now, there is a historical context to the work that's worth bearing in mind, not because it determines what we should think about um, the work, but because it might enable us to think about some of the connections that aren't obvious, um, some of the ways in which work that surrounds Sartre's transcendence of the ego, work that surrounds what we might think of as the birth of Sartrean existentialism at this point, um, it, may, it enables us to maybe make some of those connections by 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 thinking about the context in which in which the work is produced. So uh, just to repeat, we can't think about the context and think, well, the context is the cause of what Sartre is saying. That's not what I think would be reasonable. Um, but what we can do is enable that context to sort of have, a, have, as it were, open our horizon up and see other things that are going on. Now, in this historical context, uh, Sartre is writing Transcendence of the Ego. It's produced in 1937. Uh, it's produced in France, in Europe. Um, it's produced at a time of a war, the Spanish Civil War, um, the fascist problem, um, a problem obviously that uh, hasn't always gone away, as we're so aware of at the moment. So it's produced in, in 1937 at a time at which we can clearly see a huge intellectual ferment um, and in which we can kind of imaginatively recreate problems here that we might encounter, problems that aren't, as it were, intellectual problems but problems that touch at our heart you know what what do we do when faced with the spanish republic um and, it, and its attack by the fascists what do we do um do we join the international brigades what do we do when we're faced with people inside our own country at this time maybe in france um supporting and advocating um you know uh, politics that, that align with german fascism uh, what do we do how do we respond is, is it of a, is it of any relevance to us can we avoid it can we um can we just do nothing and sit on the sidelines? All these kind of moments push hard on us. Um, and I think that's important for the context of, of thinking about what Sartre is doing at this point. Um, they push hard on us in the way in which we see at the contemporary moment, the Black Lives Matter movement pushing hard on people to, to think about their relationships to structural racism, to white privilege, to, to uh, structures of capitalism in which race um, is operating in such an exploitative and oppressive way. So, so at certain points, in certain contexts, issues issues aren't just abstract and outside of us and somehow over there and capable of being dealt with neutrally, let's say. Um, they push hard on us um, and, and they impinge and we can't quite, even if we do avoid them, we can't really avoid them. We're, we're in this sense, you know, forced into this situation um, of taking responsibility for our response uh, to the world around us. So that's one of the big contexts. But there's also an intellectual context, quite specific in a way, that Sartre is part of. And central to this intellectual context is between 1933 and 1939, there's a series of lecture seminars run by a guy called Alexander Kojave. My, my pronunciation is probably terrible, apologies. Um, at these, these lectures uh, are on Hegel's phenomenology of spirit, and Kojave is uh, a kind of core moment in, in many ways in the formation of a lot of what then goes on later in France um, and in intellectual life in philosophy. And this, this moment of the Kojavian lectures 
um, is is a, is it part of this this as I say this context in which Sartre is working? And these lectures are as much uh, productive of Lacan's work and as they are productive of Sartre's work in some ways. Now, Cogé's lectures aren't aren't actually published until forty seven. Um, they're not published till after the war, and in some ways they're published as a kind of retrospective. I think almost like a retrospective attempt to show the source of a whole series of things, a whole series of moves that are beginning to be made primarily by Sartre in the field of philosophy and primarily by Lacan in the field of psychoanalysis. Um, and so I think in some ways, uh, you know, it's important to kind of look back at this particular like relationship that Kojave has placed in terms of context. <laughs> So thank you for the pronunciation. It might be spot on, I don't know. Um, anyway, so, so Koje is focused very heavily on offering a reading of Hegel um, that both attempts to show Hegel's, I wouldn't say correctness or rightness, but that, that Hegel attempts to answer something very, very important about knowledge and knowing yourself. But he does so in such a way as to present it particularly through this notion of what he calls mutual recognition. He does it in such a way as to present um, subjectivity as a negotiative relationship um, and this constantly kind of curious negotiative relationship. And this central to Kojé's reading is this, is this sort of articulation of mutual recognition. And this articulation of mutual recognition places subjectivity, if you like, into um, a dialogical relationship. It places it into a relationship, if you're maybe Lacan, where you're, where you're in this kind of seeing, how do you see yourself and how do others see you? Um, if you're Sartre, again, how do you see yourself and how do others see you, but in a slightly different way. And so they, in the background to this, um, this, this, this work, what we have is both, both in, the, in the political and social context and in the intellectual context, uh, a dynamic that is forcing the concept of subjectivity to split open and to and to be connected uh, with the world around it and to see how it can be both subject um, how we can both have have that sense of subjectivity and how dependent or how controlled or how constrained or how connected and, and intertwined it is um, with things around us and so in, we, we are being forced as it were to sort of give up a sense of absolute power that is associated in some ways with subjectivity. We've been forced to sort of give up in some ways this sort of sense of isolation. And the, and the subject is being really sort of connected back in again. And, and in, in a way, what Sartre is doing is attempting to um, not restore because it wasn't there before, but attempting to articulate in, the, in his concept of consciousness the active force within subjectivity. He does this around the concept of spontaneity. Okay, so this is a phrase of his. This is a, this is from page ninety, from page seventy nine. Genuine spontaneity must be perfectly clear. It is what it produces and can be nothing else. Now, this self-creative relationship. This is this is a relationship what we call creative, uh, you know, creation from nothing, self-creation from nothing. There is no cause that's produced this particular effect. Um, it's a self-productive moment. And so consciousness is this kind of self-productive moment. This is what Sartre calls uh, spontaneity. And this spontaneity occurs precisely at the pre-reflective level. It's not at the reflective level. It's not the reflective moment that has any kind of capacity for power or activation here. Uh, the reflective moment, um, as he says earlier in the text, you know, reflection poisons desire. Um, reflection in some way distorts or, or you know has a negative effect it has a kind of um, an obscuring effect on this this spontaneous uh, element um, of consciousness the core element of consciousness that produces itself um, as what it is it's self-productive and he wants to explore this um, because he, he thinks that, that there's a more fundamental problem here. It's not just somehow that reflection, you know, has a distorting effect, uh, but the, dis, the what we, and this is what we're going to look at in the second half of today, is but the, the reflective process actually is a kind of means of escape, means of escaping our freedom. So when we begin to reflect upon ourselves, we begin to take ourselves as primarily that which we encounter in the reflective moment, uh, this fundamentally means as an I, um, and as an ego, um, when, we, when we take that seriously, what this is, is in fact a strategy for avoiding our freedom. 
but we'll have to sort of get to that bit by bit hopefully let's let's take our first steps in trying to look at that by taking the example um, from the text uh, as I say I wasn't particularly keen on using PowerPoint but I wanted to try and focus a bit more on the text this time so let's take this example that he offers on page 62 the example of hatred um, a hatred of Peter Peter and Paul are figures throughout Sartre's work here at this point in his life you find them in Transcendence of the Ego, you find them all the way through being in nothingness and all sorts of other strange little places. So Peter and Paul are his characters. And the example of um, hatred of Peter we find on page 62 of Transcendence of the Ego. And what he wants to explore is a reflective experience of hatred. So I'm just going to read you a bit of a passage here. Uh, let's bring it up. Um, So obviously this is Sartre, this is page 62 of Transcendence of the Ego. And let's just have a read through this uh, before we go on. Let us consider a reflective experience of hatred. I see Peter. I feel a sort of profound convulsion of repugnance and anger at the sight of him. I am already on the reflective level. The convulsion is consciousness. I cannot be mistaken when I say I feel at this moment a violent repugnance for Peter. But is this experience of repugnance hatred? Obviously not. Moreover, it is not given as such. In reality, I have hated Peter a long time, and I think that I shall always hate him. An instantaneous consciousness of repugnance could not, then, be my hatred. If I limited it, if I limited it to what it is, to something instantaneous, I could not even speak of hatred any more. I would say I feel a repugnance for Peter at this moment, and thus I would not implicate the future. But precisely by this refusal, refusal to implicate the future, I would cease to hate. Now my hatred appears to me at the same time as my experience of repugnance, but it ex appears through this experience. It is given precisely as not being limited to this experience. My hatred was given in and by each moment of disgust, of repugnance and of anger, but at the same time it is not any of them. My hatred escapes from each of them by affirming its permanence. It affirms that it had already appeared when I thought about Peter with so much fury yesterday and that it will appear tomorrow. It affects by itself, moreover, a distinction between to be and to appear, since it gives itself as continuing to be, even when I am absorbed in other occupations and no consciousness reveals it. This is enough, it would seem, to enable us to affirm that hatred is not of consciousness. It overflows the instantaneousness of consciousness, and it does not bow to the absolute law of consciousness for which no distinction is possible between appearance and being. Hatred, then, is a transcendent object. Now what's kind of crucial here is this refrain all the way through, just pop this back up, this refrain all the way through about this instantaneous moment. And what we're beginning to encounter in the experience of repugnance, rather than hatred, is we're beginning to encounter what it is uh, to have consciousness on the pre-reflective level. If I reflect in a pure way, and this is a distinction that Sartre uses, if I reflect in a pure way, that's when I say something like, I feel a repugnance for Peter at this moment. I feel X. So in a, in a pure reflective moment, I can encounter my feeling. Um, but, it, that, but that pure reflection has no implication in the future. And it, what that means is, is that just because I'm experiencing something now, it doesn't determine how I'm going to experience something in the future. So I can experience repugnance at this moment, but that doesn't mean that tomorrow I'm going to necessarily have the same feeling. And so what we end up with is two different knowledge relationships. This is Sartre. It is certain that Peter is repugnant to me, but it is not and always will remain doubtful that I hate him. So it's certain, on the one hand, this certain relationship to my pre-reflective experience. I can't doubt the nature of my pre-reflective experience. I can describe it. I feel a repugnance for Peter at this moment. Um, but the other thing, where I might say something like, because I hate him, um, that because that explanation, that moment, 
um, or, or where I might say something like, I hate Peter and so I feel a repugnance for him when I see him. That, that extra moment at which I'm beginning to um, describe what we call, a, what Sartre calls a state, um, at that particular moment I'm also distorting something. Um, and this is an impure reflection. And this is the nature of most reflective experiences, they're kind of impure reflections. Um, that, that produce a kind of distortion. And what happens in that moment is that the hatred is taken to be a cause for the repugnance. So I hate Peter, therefore when I see Peter I feel repugnant. Um, and we encounter this kind of image of thought, as Deleuze might call it. We can encounter this kind of way of conceiving of, of the relationship between concepts. Here the concept of repugnance and the concept of hatred, such that one determines the other. But what Sartre is saying is that a state, such as this kind of state I'm in when I see Peter, has an imminent character that's given for itself. Um, but its meaning, or, or the way in which we attempt to describe its meaning, uh, tends to confuse that meaning as a kind of transcendental element, as a kind of element that is producing. It kind of dis it confuses that, that transcendent meaning um, rather transcendent, not transcendental, transcendent meaning with the imminent appearance. We kind of take, take as, as though we've got a causal explanation, um, the hatred as being prior. And in fact, that hatred is something that's kind of being constructed on top, away from, above, um, as it were, outside of the actual experience itself, the actual, the actual consciousness itself. It's being imposed in many ways upon it. And we go from a situation in which we might say something like, I feel X, which is the pure reflection, I, just, I feel X, to the moment in which we say something like, I feel X because Y, um, which is this impure reflection. And this, this, this is, Sartre describes this as a process of emanation. We think of this as somehow sort of an emanation of the repugnance out of the hatred. Um, and this is the kind of causal explanation. But the problem with this for Sartre is that this makes consciousness inert. If we take this explanation seriously, if we think that the hatred has caused my repugnance, then the consciousness of the repugnance is an effect of the hatred. And it's by, in, in, that, in that moment, it's produced as inert, it's produced as passive, it's produced as an effect. And this, Sartre thinks, is utterly, utterly to be rejected. Let's take, uh, it's uh, 7.31, let's just have a, f a few minutes uh, stretching, doing something else. 7.35, I'll be back um, and we'll come back to, uh, we'll come back to this repugnance and hatred. In the meantime, I'll leave up a bit of the text. So yeah, back at 7.35, have a, go and grab a glass of water, stretch your legs, do something that makes your body work. <laughs> 
right let's uh, get back to it have you got hopefully you got your glass of water or your beer or whatever you can have now <clears throat> so let's go back to this this repugnance thing um and importantly this relationship between what we can think of as the imminent feeling um the i feel x and the transcendent meaning i feel x because of y um and so what kind of relationship between the imminent feeling and the transcendent meaning now this is where sartre um i think does something i think quite brave in a way um he kind of embraces uh an a causality a lack of causality at this point and he uses in particular a very a very kind of curious way of embracing this um, and one that I've explored in some of my other work, uh, but that I can't really go into in enormous detail here. But if you're interested, you can look up my work on notebook11.com um, and then you'll encounter why why I've been interested in this problem for, for a long time, um, 15 years at least. And so what Sartre says is that there's a, there's a kind of a-causal a relationship, um, in fact, um, a productive relationship. Um, and in fact, he, he uses the phrase a magical bond. Um, and he introduces this relationship that spontaneity, this spontaneous consciousness has with the kind of ways in which it's bound together, brought together, made meaningful, um, and way in which it produces transcendent objects, if you like, faces, covers, masks, of what it is. Uh, he, he uses this phrase, uh, magic, it's sorcery. Um, and I'll again just read a little bit, a little bit from, from what he's saying. Um, let's just put him back up. This is page 81 to 82 of Transcendence of the Ego. Uh, ignore the first bit of the paragraph for a moment, we'll get to that. Um, but this bit down here. Uh, we are thus surrounded by magical objects, which retain, as it were, a memory of the spontaneity of consciousness, yet continue to be objects of the world. This is why man is always a sorcerer for man. Indeed, this poetic connection of two passivities in which one creates the other spontaneously is the very foundation of sorcery, the profound meaning of participation. That, this is also why we are sorcerers for ourselves each time we view our me. Now this, um, this kind of curious relationship here this curious role for magic and sorcery suddenly introduced into the text suddenly popping up um, is deeply connected to this relationship to spontaneity because one of the things that consciousness has to have in order for it to be free is it has to have this capacity to be its self-creative creation ex nihilo from nothing um, and it has to do in, in a sense something that only a magician or a sorcerer can do which is create life create create connections and and, and living things but also create um facsimiles um of connections and living things so the example just before that is an example of of uh, a kind of relationship one might have in a kind of pre-reflective conscious moment to someone who's mimicking someone else an actor for example in which we encounter a kind of particularly with mimicry we encounter a kind of a presence of something that's absent we encounter this kind of ghostly effect um of the mask actually working if the mimic's any good you know the, the person is kind of there um and yet of course they're also not there and and it, it's this kind of curious creative power uh that um that is kind of involved in this sorcery it's also worth noting that, that um, later on Deleuze and Guattari in A Thousand Plateaus uh, in the chapter on becoming animal will describe themselves there as sorcerers. We sorcerers they will talk about there. And there's clearly some sort of strong connection uh, between this moment here um, of what we can call this, what, he, what Sartre calls this kind of moment of poetic connection, poetic production, um, and what I called at the end of the Kierkegaard section, poetic reason. There's clearly this kind of connection, there's clearly some sort of interesting connection between uh, the spontaneity and creative power of consciousness that Sartre is positing and the way in which uh, Deleuze and Guattari want to encounter the kind of production of various becomings um, in their work. But that's something that would, would have to be explored on another day. But but 
this creative power, this 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 creative power. One of the one of the other elements that that kind of is brought forward by talking about it in terms of a kind of sorcery. Uh, this creative power is also uh, something we're scared of, and that's kind of fundamental to what Sartre is arguing: is that the dynamic of consciousness is one in which consciousness is afraid of its own creative power. It's kind of a feared of it, um, and it's constantly trying to avoid it. This is the concept that will be developed in being a nothingness into bad faith. But it's here and it's present inside transcendence of the ego, and it's explained inside transcendence of the ego um, <laughs> without actually using the concept, the phrase bad faith. But let's just try and, I mean, try and take it relatively simply. I mean, what essentially Sartre thinks happens is that the direction of constitution of the ego, the way in which we come to be able to say I or me, um, is in our reflective moments inverted and it, the inversion sort of turns back on itself uh, and uh, the, the source of, of the constitution. And so primarily we begin, he thinks, with consciousness, spontaneous creative consciousness, um, which produces a series of states. And so that consciousness is, as it were, the moment of repugnance. Um, the state would be kind of the unification of a whole series of these moments into a meaning such as hatred of Peter. Realising a kind of moment in the third moment in which I go, I hate Peter. And the ego that's come about there, the ego that hates Peter, the I that thinks it hates Peter, um, is, as it were, imbued with the power of creation, imbued with the power here of like, you know, um, of, of, of having produced this relationship, and yet it's a complete inversion. And Sartre argues here, and this, this bit's kind of troubling in a way, because what he says is that the spontaneity of consciousness is projected onto the ego. Now this, let's just, uh, for, for now, just avoid obvious weird problems about how on earth it's going to project it um they, we can we can kind of maybe see what he's trying to do if we think about um uh as it were uh, the, an, att an attempt to understand the world in an attempt to understand the world there's a kind of uh, setting up of a particular representation so there's a kind of projection of something here um but there are other problems there but he argues that spontaneity, or he claims that spontaneity of consciousness is projected onto the ego. And one of the questions we can ask, even if we think projection is, is you know, difficult, let's just ask a question of why is that the case? Let's just go back through some of the moments in Sartre's case again. First of all, the ego only appears with reflection. There is no ego inside um, the, the pre-reflective consciousness moment. This was what we called last week and we encountered as the transcendental field of consciousness, the impersonal, without people field of consciousness and so it's individuated but it's not personalized it doesn't have um, at that point an i or a me it's just repugnance feeling repugnance or something in that in that sort of situation and the ego only appears with reflection and it never appears Sartre says unless there's reflection so as such it appears always as, as cut off from the world the ego appears in a situation in which there's a subject object split and it appears in that way by producing a sense of interiority so interiority is, in a sense, um, the way in which the ego is able to appear as distinct. Um, and in order to appear as distinct, it appears as distinct from the world and produces this kind of split. And what Sartre thinks is kind of pushing this or, or kind of, because we have to be careful here, because there can't, there, can't be, there can't be a causal relationship. This is, this is Sartre's argument. There can't be a causal relationship. Now, whether Sartre can sustain this is, is another matter. But there can't really be a causal relationship. But in a sense, this, this, um, this, this split, this interiority, this, in, this, this eye that appears in the moment of reflection <clears throat> is a defense, he says, against the spontaneity of consciousness, against creation ex nihilo. The me is passive. In, this, in relationship to this spontaneity. Um, and, and it kind of can't cope with this. And it has this relationship of being produced, um, as it were, uh, to try and escape the, the capture um, that, we've, we've been that we've been, you know, the way in which we've been caught inside our own freedom. There's an example he gives about the impossibility, for example, of being able to will a state of consciousness. <clears throat> 
And it's such as like, you know, when you want to say something like, I'm going to fall asleep, I will fall asleep. Or when you don't want to think about something horrible and you go, I'm not going to think about this. And of course, you know, the more you will to do this, the more you will to do this, the less it's going to happen. And in fact, if you want to be able to go to sleep and not think about it, something, you know, you're much better off not trying to do that directly, but taking a completely oblique dynamic. And in fact, essentially allowing pre-reflective consciousness to, you know, be the dominant way in which you might not have this, uh, you know, awakeness or this, um, you know, fear of, of thinking about something. And so you might go for a walk or something. You might, you know, um, uh, you might lay there and relax and listen to the radio or, you know, you might do a whole series of other things um, that are going to kind of help you produce a situation in which spontaneously you're going to go to sleep or spontaneously you're going to think about something else other than the thing you don't want to think about. Um, and you're going to enable that perhaps power of spontaneous consciousness to take place, but you can't call it into existence. You can't call a state of consciousness into existence um, because the source of power is that state of consciousness, pre-reflective consciousness itself. This is to quote Sartre again. Each instant of our conscious life reveals to us a creation ex nihilo, not a new arrangement but a new existence. There is something distressing for each of us to catch in the act this tireless creation of existence of which we are not the creators. We escape ourselves, overflow ourselves, surprise ourselves. And it's in this kind of relationship that we can get to grips with this idea of liberation and capture. The consciousness that produces us and which is not us uh, is the source of power and the us that has been produced the us that arises in the reflective moment is aware of the fact that it's been produced and it's aware of the fact that it's not got the creative power and the creative power of consciousness is actually something that in a sense terrifies it we cannot capture in a sense what we are we cannot in some ways know what we are um, if by no we mean something like predict or, or be able to understand or or you know be certain we cannot guarantee who we are if consciousness is the source of spontaneity itself we have no control over this we have no ability to produce consciousness here because we are the products of the transcendental field of consciousness the impersonal conscious acts that take place and that are there as the kind of uh, prime productive moment of subjectivity. Our freedom ca captures us in its spontaneity, in its capacity to create from nothing. And we spend our lives trying to avoid accepting what Sartre calls this monstrous freedom, trying to, he describes it in this way, hypnotize ourselves into passivity. And this, this desperate attempt to avoid the spontaneous source of the creation of subjectivity, one that we can't own, one that does not belong and cannot in principle belong to anyone, um, this desperate attempt to try and avoid this is the source of what he thinks of as bad faith. Because this spontaneous creativity capacity is also the source of our freedom. We're always in a position to be able to uh, you know, embrace this freedom, to be created as the free, e, the free ego, the free I, in relationship to the situation around us, not in an abstract and sort of ridiculous way. Um, I mean, it's not like you know, we're, we're in prison and we have the you know, freedom to just not be in prison, but we do obviously have the freedom to think about escape and to act in such a way. We obviously have a, a, a freedom, Sartre argues, to be able to respond to, to the world around us. Um, in a way in which uh, you know we take responsibility for that response, um, and as I said, in the context of of which the, in which the work is being written, you can see how those situations are being pushed and impinged upon, and how this isn't simply an abstract intellectual exercise that's been arrived at. There's a kind of whole context and framework in which. Uh, this relationship between liberation and capture in, in terms of our subjectivity is being played out and we can imagine being played out. What's crucial to understand, I think, in terms of Sartre is that he wants to articulate 
uh, an absolute freedom at the heart of what we call subjectivity. But in doing so, the very concept of subjectivity has transformed itself in such a way as to become something deeply problematic because obviously we're kind of as subjects captured and, and liberated by the spontaneous power of our consciousness, by the free element of ourselves, if you like. Um, and he wants to, Sartre wants to oppose this to the way in which another, this other dynamic in relationship to subjectivity and kind of split or relational subjectivity is occurring, perhaps through someone like Lacan, but primarily for Sartre, he talks about Freud. And so he wants to, he wants to push back against this idea that there's some kind of unconscious, there's some kind of libidinal drive um, that is, is then being constrained, articulated, and, and then expressed through a relationship between the drive and the ego. Um, and he wants to, because in that situation for Sartre, um, what, what, what we're essentially in is a situation where we're caught, we're captured, um, not by freedom, but by determinism, by a kind of animality, by something that is outside of consciousness, by something that, um, uh, that we are unable to, as it were, articulate uh, other than in a kind of semi-biological, semi-naturalistic sort of way. Um, and obviously nowadays that's far more dominant inside most people's thinking. Most people, particularly inside philosophy, but most people generally in, in, in like liberal, no, liberal sort of dynamics kind of want to make their understanding of consciousness somehow connected into um, the natural sciences. Somehow if we understand enough about brains and we understand enough about ethnography and we understand enough about behaviour and people and all this kind of stuff, um, we're going to know what consciousness is. We're going to know how to work with it, how to deal with it, how to produce it, perhaps in artificial intelligence or all sorts of things, you know, um, because we're going to know uh, what produces consciousness. We're going to know how to recreate it because of that capacity to know what produces it. We're going to know how to control it if you're a Freudian by being able to encounter and deal with the drives that are causing us all these confusing ideas, all these productions of, of difficulties within the ego. But it's all to do with, as it were, being able to encounter and deal with a deterministic relationship between causes and effects, between things that are taking place of which we have no control and things we do have control of. So it's this constant attempt to sort of find control in the midst of a world that determines us in many ways to behave in particular kind of um, in particular kind of forms. And what Sartre is doing is 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 trying to hold on to something that he thinks is discovered in the Cartesian moment, um, discovered in that moment of certainty at the heart of the cogito, um, and what he thinks is encountered in those moments is is is, is a kind of the the most useful, powerful, potent concept of creation and spontaneity um, that we can, you know, get hold of, and in particular that we can get hold of in such a way as to be able to affirm our freedom. This obviously is something that nowadays <coughs> people seem to quite happily want to give up. They're quite happy to become um, even even when they you know want to be free they're quite happy to become something like you know sophisticated machines um and and they don't seem to have you know a worry about this perhaps they might say something like you know there are two kinds of things and there's something special about the human um if they want to sort of uh, you know enable the human to have some sort of still core center point to their value systems or to their moral systems um, so that they can say something like well it's humans that are kind of able to create values it's humans that are able to kind of create meaning or all these kind of relationships and often at the back of this is some sort of specific relationship to the creativity of language um, and the creativity and, and relationship to language and so we end up in this and have done for a long time this particular kind of curious relationship where if there is any freedom um, then it's somehow connected to the way in which we can articulate meaning. And what Sartre is doing is, is something quite different from this in many, many ways, and actually affirming that there's something very peculiar, there's something ontologically distinct and strange about consciousness itself, and um, particularly active consciousness, creative consciousness, the consciousness that is going to produce the eye, the consciousness that is going to enable, as it were, the reflective moment to take place. And this affirmation is is still in many ways very strange for us, but it's a kind of core guiding thread inside existentialism. Just briefly, for those who were with us when we were dealing with the Kierkegaard 
it's important here to kind of think back to the moment of Abraham raising the knife and the moment of uh, not just the sort of um, insularity here, the, not just the separation and the incommunicability, although those things we did talk about very much and they were very interesting things to talk about, uh, but what's at the heart of the terror, in a sense, that Abraham encounters um, is the fact that he can. Um, not the fact that he doesn't, not the fact that he has faith, not even, in a sense, the leap, leap of faith, but the fact that he can kill his son, the fact that he can, the fact that this consciousness that is there, that is, um, as it were, the real background relationship, the real background productive force, is able to do this and is able to do almost anything um, and has this freedom to go beyond, in Kierkegaard's case for Abraham, to go beyond the ethical situation, to do the teleological suspension of the ethics. Um, and to, and to have this kind of capacity to produce through a leap a, a new situation and this is i think a core element that all of the existentialists want to kind of produce this 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 relationship to a specific creative power the the, the, the for some obviously for the christian existentialist is kind of a specific relationship to the creative power of god and so they then have to deal with how you know whether this is an analogy to god or whether this is some sort of specific kind of instance of god and um, but for the existential atheists like sartre the creative power is is that which in a sense um we encounter through being human it's not the creative power of humanity but it's that which we encounter through being human we encounter through being conscious and we encounter this creative power in such a way that it terrifies us and produces a whole series of responses as i've said that want to kind of um, enable us to to not have to face up to our responsibility not have to face up to our freedoms um, and this i think is where existentialism still is and can be interesting because the capacity for creative spontaneity that that spontaneous moment um can't exist inside a naturalistic explanation of the world. There are no spontaneous moments. There are accidents there. There is no spontaneity. There is a kind of world that's ordered and related, and in which, um, if you were to see the recent program that was on 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 BBC Two, BBC One, I think it was called uh, Deuce or Devs. It went by the name Devs. You know it, it, what what was going on there is 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 is, a, is a, they had a, they had a machine capable of like understanding at a quantum level all of the different connections that were taking place, and in in producing this machine, were able to see the future. And this kind of um, principle excludes any spontaneity, excludes any kind of creativity, produces everything in such a way that it's a passivity and pacifies subjectivity. Um, as part of that, even if we explain it in in, a, in the most sophisticated way possible, we end up with a pacified subjectivity. Whereas the existentialist key to the existentialist is this relationship to an active, spontaneous consciousness, something that breaks the causal order, something that is a kind of sorcery because of that, or that we might perhaps only encounter in magic or sorcery because of this, and something that um, is 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 a key part of the universe um, and one that we we are um, um, you know almost obligated to uh, face up to. That's kind of the existentialist key thematic and this relationship to active, spontaneous, creative um, forces is kind of crucial in understanding what it is that they're actually affirming. Okay, it's it's a minute to eight o'clock. Um, the uh, seminar will begin on Zoom for Free University Brighton people. Uh, so go through river and stuff and we'll give it five minutes or so for us to gather there. So get yourself a cup of tea, come and have a, have a chat. Tell me where you think I've gone completely bonky uh, or what you didn't understand. Um, and we'll see where we can go from there. For everybody else on Twitch, um, you're welcome to follow me, check out the Discord and the YouTube and various other bits and pieces. And um, the course will be continuing next week. So if you're just around on Twitch, I'll catch you next week. We'll be looking a little bit more Sartre and some more problems around freedom and um, causation. See you then.